good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here today. Um, so we're going to be talking a bit more about transdisciplinary design in practice. So we've got an amazing array of, of panellists joining me here today. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves uh, in a bit and we're going to discuss firstly a bit what actually what we think transdisciplinary design is. Um, I'm just going to start with a little uh, introduction to myself. My name is Caroline Till. I am the co-founder of a research and design agency called Franklin Till. Um, we work with quite a broad range of global brands and organizations, and we specifically work with uh, color and material innovation to help shift brands towards a more sustainable trajectory. Um, so we're really passionate about the role of materiality in shifting us towards a more sustainable and ultimately regenerative future. Um, I originally trained as a textile designer, and I'm quite passionate about this topic of, of transdisciplinarity, because I do remember in my textile days being quite frustrated, uh, especially in my sort of masters being told, You're just, you just make the fabrics, you just make things look pretty, you don't need to think about where it's going, what it should be applied to. And I think, you know, 20 years ago when I was studying, it was a very siloed discipline. Um, I also worked for sort of 10 years in higher education, um, uh, sort of rewriting a master's which is called Material Futures at Central St. Martins and um, that master's was really built on transdisciplinarity. I think we were actually one of the first um, uh, sort of postgraduate courses that invited students to apply from all disciplines and I don't just mean coming from a different design background that wasn't material focused, I mean we embraced uh, philosophy students, um, astrophysicists, uh, you know, scientists, so we were really trying to uh, bring all disciplines together and maybe we can touch on some of the challenges of that, so the infrastructure of the college for example, I think I was probably the most hated course leader by, by uh, particularly technicians used to often knock on my door and sigh and say things like Caroline your students have been laser cutting cheese again or you know and, and sort of telling me that they weren't trained in specific areas to be able to use specific equipment and also financial issues that specific courses were allocated to specific budgets and all sorts of challenges like that but anyway I won't go too far into that but more recently I think our work at Franklin Till as we're you know trying to move these big brands, we're working with people like Adidas, like Ikea, trying to take them towards more sustainable production processes, we realise that it's absolutely fundamental to have a multi-pronged approach and to bring different expertise and perspectives in, in a shared purpose. Um, and most recently we uh, guest curated an exhibition that opened at the Barbican last year called Our Time on Earth, um, which was all about sort of bringing design ideas to, to how we can envisage a future in which people and planet could flourish together. And the core part of that was bringing some beautiful partnerships together, whether that was an ecologist and a designer or a technologist and a climate activist. And, and actually where that convergence happens was where the kind of really meaty stuff was, uh, was occurring. So, yeah, so this is a, you know, a, a sort of this conversation, this, this subject is a personal passion of mine and, and I, I know that um, that passion is shared by the panellists that are with me today. So without further ado, I'll stop talking about myself and um, I'd love to just invite each uh, of this amazing esteemed panel that we have here today to introduce themselves and just, if you don't mind, spend a couple of minutes um, talking about what does transdisciplinary design mean to you and indeed how does it inform your, your work or practice. So, Moritz, can we start with you? Sure, yes. So, my name is Moritz Waldemeyer. I run a small design studio here in London. Uh, we do innovative projects with light uh, and uh, we work in different industries. We enjoy uh, sort of being inspired in one place and maybe applying it in another place. Uh, so some of the projects we've done in the past, uh, we've worked in uh, the automotive industry, we've worked in music, uh, dressing people in light, uh, we have done almost architectural size installation, we've done small products, little tabletop things. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, quite varied and uh, most recently we've worked in a church and I'm just going to plug this quickly because it's part of London Design Festival. There's an installation at the St. Stephen Walbrook uh, and we installed uh, a pendulum uh, which uh, creates a very quite magical effect. I invite you to go and see that. It's open from today. 
So there was another question to that uh, dis interdisciplinary... What does transdisciplinary design yes. mean to you? Yes, what does it mean? Well, as I say, I really enjoy uh, sort of dipping toes in like quite diverse places. And uh, that also means that I get to meet people with very, very different backgrounds and collaborate with them. And uh, I find that particularly um, uh, exciting and uh, stimulating. Uh, it, one day it might be I'm, I'm working with a very talented woodworker or we work with glass quite often, so then I have to sort of understand the process and how does that all work and how can this uh, craftsperson get the maximum out of their craft and how can then I use it or maybe change it slightly uh, to bring a new effect. Uh, so I very much en enjoy this, so just the learning uh, about these various different materials and uh, processes and, uh, uh, and also meeting people, uh, and that is just as important. Amazing, thank you. And Jason, I'd love to hand over to you. Okay, this works. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Good. Yeah, so my name's uh, Jason Holly. I'm the principal of Universal Design Studio. Um, I guess the easiest way to describe the practice, which probably plays into this, is uh, architecture and interiors. Um, I, and I guess it's from that position, really, that we've tried to sort of define our practice. You know, I, I am an architect, so apologies to architects out there if at times I'm sort of critical of what we as a, as a, as a group do and how we view our profession. But I guess I have a sort of a, equally a kind of a... Um, both a love but also a disappointment for, for architecture in terms of what it, it can and could do and doesn't do. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of asking our team to, you know, look out the window, look at the spaces around them, look at the buildings around them and, and you know, do they feel that's, you know, good enough? Do they feel like that's kind of, you know, exciting them? Is it kind of enriching them? Is it meeting their needs? Um, Apart from, obviously, I can't say that today because we're in a, a beautiful <laughs> lecture hall. But, you know, there are very few, I would say, that really do kind of meet the, uh, I guess, the criteria that I think we deserve in terms of our built environment. Um, and I think part of that is a problem that, that uh, architecture as a practice has almost retreated from the difficulty of, of trying to do that. I think it, it has retreated back into a place where it, it prefers to think of it as an object, as a sort of static um, perfect, beautiful, clean, uh, timeless object. Um, whereas we know uh, the challenges of, of the, the planet are only getting increasingly complex, and they require, um, you know, no, you know, no one discipline can really tackle that. You have to look outside of your disciplines. You have to pull people together to start to try and figure out how we're going to um, solve some of these things. So that's really the kind of I think the, the premise on what, what our practice is, is based. Um, as a result, we, um, we always have a kind of a tension with architecture and, our, and the ways of doing things, whether it's these are kind of the stages that you should follow in a project, this is how you should you know, bring people in, this is how you should communicate. Um, and also, even just with regards to sectors, you know, the sectors become so siloed and so kind of insular in terms of their frame of reference that we find that we start to see sectors kind of almost like disappearing down this sort of plug hole, really, in terms of we're an increasingly creating a rarefied language that other people have no access into or can't really even understand. So again, we, we work across all sectors, hospitality, retail, workplace, residential, exhibition, and we do not have any definition within the studio of like, that is the retail team and that is the exhibition team. We make sure that, that we're always mixing up these teams to make sure that we've got different perspectives coming from different directions, always to make sure that we've got this kind of base expertise in terms of what we're doing. Um, but it, 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 it you know, creates a very kind of active, uh, challenging environment for us to work in. But still, I can't find a better way of describing what we do as other than architecture and interiors. But we prefer to kind of go through that as a sort of a, a Trojan horse and then have clients go, oh, I didn't realize you did that, which is great for clients because it's sort of like, oh God, you're going to question that. You're going to you know, look at that. You're going to pull that apart. You're going to go upstream and ask why and what, what's this all for? Um, probably less uh, happier the financial department just because you know, they would much rather it was you know, people paying for this stuff. But I'm a firm believer that you, you should give away that knowledge you know, and you should at all opportunities try to, to uh, share that knowledge with others. So that was a, a sort of a, a short and long introduction. Brilliant, thank you. And Natsai, can you introduce your practice through the lens of transdisciplinary design? 
Um, so my name is Natsai Audrey Chiesa, and I'm the founder of Faber Futures. We are um, an agency that is at the intersection of design and biotechnology. Um, I studied uh, studied architecture um, before um, doing Caroline's course at Material Futures, um, and that opened up possibility for p possibilities for us to think about. Um, technology uh, as it relates to culture and design. Uh, and I was really interested in biotechnology um, as a key driver of our material futures. Um, so understood pretty early on that I wasn't a biotechnologist and so I needed to create the frameworks through which I could um, create um, uh, connections with people who uh, could bring different types of knowledges um, into the domain of des design and and, and likewise the, the other way around. And so uh, for, for me, a research methodology that became quite apparent um, very early on was that you sort of needed to immerse yourself uh, physically um, and through practice um, in the environment of the other, the so-called other. And so I started um, design uh, residency um, at University College London um, as a designer working in a synthetic biology lab, trying to understand and feel for um, how these two disciplines could collide. When I started Faber Futures, it was um, after many years of design research um, in an emerging field of design called biodesign that brings these two worlds um, together. And what was interesting at the time was starting to understand the commercial landscape um, of a lot of the R&D that was happening in a laboratory context and understanding that as soon as some, you start talking about the commercial translation uh, of, of, of this research, um, that's a people question, that's an environmental question, um, that's about the, the real world, the, the ways in which these technologies proliferate in the real world. Um, and it became apparent that design was missing in how anyone thought about commercialization. Uh, in fact, designers were bring, being brought in um, as marketeers and I found that uh, to be really problematic. And so Faber Futures was started to um, try to upstream design into the lab. I understood that world. I understood the implications of having a designer at the early stage and how that might drive product innovation, how that actually might drive uh, in the context of synthetic biology, uh, which is the engineering of living systems so that they can perform certain, um, um, they have certain performative qualities that are otherwise not found in nature. But that if a designer was asking the design question of the microbe or the microorganism, that that could completely reshape um, a business model. Um, and so for, for me, understanding um, that you needed to upstream design and what is a very hostile environment, um, the, the sciences for designers uh, became the challenge. And so we have been working in a pretty sector agnostic um, capacity to be able to uh, create bridges in different ways and uh, uh, hoping that at some point there's entanglement and we, we all kind of just get it. Um, and so we have worked in a policy context with the World Economic Forum to talk about how you need to understand design as being key stakeholders in the development um, of any kind of ro roadmap uh, for synthetic biology in any geographical context. Um, how do you do that? How do you start to understand that? We work with biotechnology companies who actually want to take design um, methods into, um, into the lab in a very um, uh, material way. And so we have been, um, uh, we created and uh, programmed the Ginkgo Creative Residency uh, at a biotechnology um, startup in Boston. Uh, and for the last six years, we have uh, invited a cohort of um, creatives to be able to apply their creative discipline in that um, not only commercial environment, but extremely technological environment. They're surrounded by automation uh, or labs that are built to automate the, the, the design of living systems. And that becomes a really interesting way in for a graphic designer, for a fashion designer to reconsider their craft. But it also changes how everyone who is working in that environment um, understands the implications of what they are doing. Um, and then we, we also work with cultural institutions because it's very important to be able to distill and to disseminate um, what's at play to a public in a way that is engaging and in a way that um, my mom can understand, right? So for us, um, exhibitions are just as important as um, you know thinking strategically with World Economic Forum because if you put all of these things together, you start to get um, a more holistic approach to thinking about innovation. So the question was transdisciplinarity. How does it show up in our work? Um, <laughs> I think a good example is a project that we've just launched as part of London Design Festival, um, a brand that we have created called Normal Phenomena of Life. 
Um, and it's, it's, the, it's the first of its kind in the world because it exists um, to platform new biotechnologies, to, to productize them in a way that is meaningful for the kind of world that we live in today, um, while also um, making products that are compliant with how they need to operate in the world uh, for tomorrow. And so this is a retail platform where everything on the website is made with biology. Um, so I would encourage you to come and see our exhibition uh, to find out more because it's pretty wild what the living world um, can, can do. Amazing, thank you. And last but definitely not least, Tiff, can you tell us a bit about your role as Collaborative Unit Coordinator at London College of Fashion? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I work at London College of Fashion and I redesigned a unit that um, goes across 20 courses, at, um, and master's courses as well. So it means that um, we get marketeers, we get makers and we get media students who are all collaborating in teams to answer or address a challenge. And what that means is that I have to go out and find good industry and academic partners who are willing to be scrutinized a lot <laughs> and actually bring forward some challenges that are really happening in the fashion landscape at the moment. So the idea behind it is that these challenges are very live and it means that students are actually addressing things that are happening in the fashion industry at the moment, which is great for them. Um, and it also means with industry that um, they kind of open up their businesses to data, insights, all those things so that um, teams of students can actually come in and look and address what, what things are happening within their industry and what they can do to address those things. And I think what's been really interesting is that I come from an educational background, so I'm a trained teacher. Um, but I've also worked with the Design Museum and I've also worked in other museums as well as a freelancer. Um, I've worked in the HE sector and I've worked in the FE sector as well. So what I'm really interested in is making sure that young people and adults have the opportunity to understand what it means to collaborate when they're learning. And I think that's really missing. I mean, I went through a very traditional um, art school and we didn't collaborate much at all. We were in our silos and um, I think that was quite wrong actually because when you go out in, into industry you don't work that way you never do you always work with other people um, and you always work to address issues situations whatever they might be you need more than one mind and you know and I think this unit is really interesting for students who are, who are really wanting to think about moving out of their own practice think about how their skills and expertise um, how they influence others as well. It's really, really interesting. And I think, you know, it's something that other colleges are starting to look at. You know, look at what we're doing, look at that template for how we're doing it. Um, and I think collaboration is going to be a big deal in, in, in just, well, not just in industry, but in, in education at some point moving up. So um, what's really been interesting for me looking at transdisciplinary design is how on earth do you make sure that 600 students collaborate? Well. It can be quite tough, and a lot of students don't want to. <laughs> so I think it's great to be able to have almost like a structure or a platform to make these things happen. So um, it's about designing something which is open, but also with, within a context, within a very you know, sort of strict framework. And that's always a really real balance. So it's quite a tricky balance, especially if you're working in the creative industries and it's a creative program. So um, I'm, what interests me about transdisciplinary design is how on earth do we make these things happen? Who do we, who do we find to make that happen? How do we connect people from dis different disciplines who wouldn't ordinarily work together? How do we make that happen as well? And how do we encourage that? Um, so that's, um, there's no answers. I think it's just you know, making sure that we put the support systems in place to enable that to happen. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go slightly off. I know I prepped a load of questions, but you've all said such interesting things that I wanted to sort of pick on, on something. I wanted to talk about vocabulary and like how important the sort of semantics of, of language are in, I guess, I mean, what we're talking about is, I guess, in, increased fluidity in a way, isn't it, between disciplines that we might have trained in or, or disciplines that, have, you know, that we're collaborating with or having to work within. Um, and maybe, I mean, 
this is a question that we prepped actually, but I, and I wanted to start with you, Moritz. Um, so you are really working at this sort of convergence, as, as many of us are, and almost quite hard to, um, to you know, categorise you. I remember it was something that um, one of my amazing colleagues, uh, Professor Carol Collet, used to say at UEA, uh, at Central St. Martin. She used to encourage students when they were graduating to say, OK, invent your own title that you're going to put on your business card. Are you lead imaginationist? Are you, you know, and completely even make up vocabulary. And I think in some way that's really powerful, but in some way I think that's quite problematic because ultimately you need to also find a fit. You need to find, you know, you might need to earn money. <laughs> so I'm interested in when you're working at this convergence of discipline and, and sort of touching on this idea of language, how do you make sure that you still have a clear enough sort of shop window to, that people can understand what to come to you for, what, what types of commissions or collaborations? Yeah, so I was very grateful that you prepped me for this question. It is also probably the most well-observed question I've ever received in my entire career because it, it goes right down to the problem. <laughs> so in terms of language, where I, I've tried Renaissance Man in the past, but it doesn't go well down so much like in unlocking the corporate budget. So you have to come up with something a little bit more, I don't know, down to earth, I think. Uh, so, yeah, what I tend to do is to sort of hone the description or the job description always a little bit to the person I have in front of me. So if I'm talking to an architect, then I'll, I'll pull out projects we've done in that, in, within that context and I will describe, you know, what we do, like working in, within architecture normally. Or if I'm talking to a car designer, then, you know, we're talking, well, first of all, we're talking classic cars and then uh, we're getting into the more sort of like new challenges and what electric cars mean and uh, how can you create uh, new interesting drama for using in the car world. So I, I try to kind of ad adapt what, what I'm saying to each person or potential client uh, and try to like uh, 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 tailor a little bit uh, what the studio is to that person be because like in, in my own mind I also find it very difficult to be, to be honest to bring it down to one point and then ma make sure that that is actually the correct point uh, that will help me in, in this situation. So yeah, it's obviously a bit more difficult having an audience in front of you and you don't know their background. So maybe you guys can give us a bit of a show of hands like how, how many designers do we have? Loads of designers, architects, a few, some photographers maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Any scientists? Yeah. Oh, 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 one, two Excellent. scientists. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, vehicle designers? Ha uh -huh, we do have, yeah. Musicians? That's already very few, yeah. So, well, now we know roughly who we're talking to. <laughs> we can be a bit more precise, or not, because it is quite a diverse crowd still. And at this point of, of vocabulary or language, I wonder if any, uh, I mean, we, we as a studio really have quite a lot of challenges with it. Um, I always sort of joke that my mum is always like, what is it that you do? Um, and I think that's almost like a quite important barometer. Um, you know, people always say that half, you know, huge percentage of the jobs that will, uh, our children are going to do don't currently exist. And so how do we sort of bridge that gap between fluidity, but also sort of relatability and accessibility? I don't know if, yeah, if you guys I, have got some experience. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think, you know, I touched upon it actually just even in my introduction. I kind of, you know, we over the years have uh, played around with all kinds of different you know, are we, you know, multidisciplinary? Are we a design studio? Are we architects? Are we interiors? Are we a consultancy? Are we, you know, all, all kind of, none of which felt appropriate because some, something was lacking at, from that. And I think one of the things that it, it's always been really, um, we've been really careful about, I think, is also just the importance of, of expertise, actually, in, this com in the conversation because, um, one of the real dangers that we found when people have entered this sort of idea of kind of, you know, transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary, however we describe it, where people are, you know, look, you know looking outside the frame of reference of their, their immediate discipline, which is fundamentally important, um, that people then don't kind of appear just as, as generalists. And, I mean, we've seen the sort of generalist model um, thrive in terms of, like, big design consultancies. Uh, apologies if anyone works at any of those. Um, but, you know, where, where I think you can argue that there is that kind of generalist approach. And, you know, we, we've always struggled as a studio to um, figure out how to play it because we have different parts of our practice. So we have 
um, Universal Design Studio, which is interiors and architecture. We have MAP, which is industrial design and product design. When our founders uh, started the business, there was also Barbonoscopy, which is furniture designers. We've now joined into a larger group, which is AKQA, which has a digital offering. We've brought Made Thought, which is graphics, into that. But the one way that we were always told by many, many people that we should do it was just merge it all, you know, merge, you know. It's really confusing for people to think, what, your university science and your map, even though you all sit together and work on projects together. You know, they were like, no, 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 just call it something else. And we were told that time and time again. And, you know, parts of the business felt, you know, look, that's a much easier way of communicating what you do. The challenge was, and what, which we felt, was that we had seen that happen in many other instances, and then the dominant department, the one that makes money, basically starts, you know, <laughs> overpowering the other departments, and things, and the expertise in the other areas starts to shrink because it's not seen as actually a profit center. So, you know, for us, we've always tried to as soon as we identify almost like an area of expertise, peculiarly, we kind of sort of almost go against ourselves and then thinking we want to um, protect it. So we, we will, you know, call it something and call it a company and say, here it is, and now you need to kind of make this stand up. You need to prove your value and that you can do this. Um, and that's still where we are today. It's, it's, it, it does feel more difficult because each business, therefore, has its own ways of working, its own processes, which equally, I think, is important. But just this, this, just this idea that it, you know, we absolutely need that depth of expertise in these, these different areas, but that's sort of linked to this kind of breadth of understanding, in a way, so that, that, that connects these disciplines. So, I mean, that's, that's for us where the kind of idea of naming disciplines has been, you know, actually really vital. You know, it, 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 it could... You know, if, if, if I'd called it all one thing, we would just, uh, I don't know, we, I probably wouldn't even be here talking about it because we'd, you know, be producing rubbish. <laughs> and that's why, you know, this notion of transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary is absolutely entrenched in everything that you do within Favour Futures. Can you tell us about some of the tools or, you know, obviously you probably have... Uh, challenges with, with vocabulary, with, um, you know, depth of expertise in specific areas. How do you start to bridge that so that you can get to a place that you can, you know, not just work together, but actually form new knowledge together? It's really challenging. Um, and part of the reason why we started the Ginkgo Creative Residency was because we wanted to make it really apparent how hard it is to collaborate with, you know, designers um, with scientist in that context and I think we're still learning um, what has been useful and it's um, there's a bit of tension is is that scholars named things for us um, and I've always am well known for kind of bristling at the idea of being called a bio designer but it's a it's a helpful shorthand to say that you're not a graphic designer right and then in an American context which is where most of our clients are, uh, they understand what bio design is because all of the corporate startups tend to call themselves something bio or the product is bio something. <laughs> so there's like a really lack of imagination about how to characterize what's at play, right? But then you, you, you need to know when you need to learn and in, lean into that to be able to, to unlock um, certain um, opportunities and resources. Um, but, you know, in terms of syntax and semiotics, I, I think what we've learned um, is that being able to show rather than tell is probably um, the quickest way to get everyone on board. A normal phenomenon of life is like a three-year three project in, in that we've been, it's been in development for the last three years. Um, and and we, we launched yesterday, and we don't know if it's going to be successful, but we've, in, in, in commercial uh, terms, but we have succeeded in showing what we've always meant. Um, and so <laughs> now it is We're going sort of to be... making it tangible. Oh, you have to make, you have to build the, um, the world, because sometimes no single word or descriptor is going to land, and everyone has an idea of what a biodesign shop is, um, and it's, it's not necessarily my idea or your idea. And so this visioning uh, is probably our most important tool. Um, I, I was going to say that I think it's kind of, yeah, absolutely, I, th I think it's what we found mm -hmm. the, by far the best way just of, of actually communicating outside your discipline, showing, you know, making, um, it's been so critical. I mean, we, we worked with um, 
IBM, and we currently still do, on designing a quantum computer, which obviously that's us collaborating with you know, quantum engineers, researchers, as well as interior designers, architects, products, industrial, and all kinds. And the one thing that we found um, that really helps us all actually have something we can talk about was one we made a model uh, last year when we when we went to a, a client and it was just a very simple like foam model like uh, volumes um and it was by far the most successful piece of design information we've ever produced as a business like it was the dumbest model in some ways in the sort of architect's way of looking at it that we've ever produced but it was as soon as we got it out everybody centered around it conversations with quantum researchers which to be fair and not again you know it's sometimes they're difficult conversations, just on an understanding level, you know. But this, we were all pointing at the same thing, moving stuff around, and it was absolutely that kind of point yeah. where, um, you know, we actually found a language by which we could communicate, because mm -hmm. we couldn't, you know, they'll talk about qubits and, you know, entanglement, and we'll be talking mm -hmm. about, you know, precision and, and other things. So, it, you know, we needed something else as that sort of, that bridge, I guess. And, and what, what I found in, in our practice is that not just showing people, but getting them involved in the making of um, has also been transformative. So I, I went to Ginkgo um, in 2017 to effectively prototype the residency program. I was the guinea pig. We were going to figure out how you actually unlock um, the infrastructure there to make it possible for us to do anything. And we um, brought in... Uh, a project that we have been developing for a really long time, which is um, microbial dye um, protocols to, uh, or, or methodologies to, to dye textiles in a more sustainable way. Um, and, and I'm walking into Ginkgo Bioworks for Context uh, was started by the very people who invented the, the discipline of synthetic biology. So it's, it's pretty dominant. It's right next to MIT. You, you feel intimidated, not just because you're not a scientist, but because of the optics, right? Um, and the first thing I did was run a workshop to show everyone how to do the thing, uh, how to dye textiles with microbes. And that was such a great leveler because suddenly everyone understood why I was valuable to their environment, that I wasn't a, an artist, um, because in America, artist means design, and it's very complicated, and it's very difficult to say, yeah, but I'm, I'm a bio designer, it's like, what's that? Um, but what I realized is what I knew and what they didn't know, in spite of having worked with this particular microbe. You know, there was a guy there who'd worked with the microbe that we used to dye textiles for like 30 years, but he'd never dyed textiles with them. And, and, and all of the things that I took for granted as to how we, we actually enforce the, 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 the protocol, um, like don't touch anything because it will become contaminated. <laughs> that was like novel, just because we shifted what the use case or the experiment looked like. So the, the, the showing and, you know, everyone finished dying their, you know, scars and, and they went, wow. And then there was buy-in that creatives need to be here. But then there was also a deep respect that there, I learned a lot about something that I thought I knew everything about. So for us, that's the, that's the, the, the trick. But it's, a very, it's a very, very difficult to, to unlock the opportunity to show. And that is why the cultural institutions are important, because they implicitly understand. So we can put that in front of the scientists and say, look at this exhibition. This is why it's valuable. You need to kind of work the, the entire ecosystem, and, and it's, it's not something that happens overnight. We're going to throw, be thinking of your questions, OK? Because uh, we're going to throw open to you in a couple of minutes. So um, I just wanted to pose to all of the panel, maybe starting with Tiff, just one. What do you think, so we've talked a bit about, you know, transdisciplinary design. There's a positive in that you can have shared purpose. You're pooling, you know, you're, you're moving outside of your remit and you're, you're pooling skills and knowledge. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges to adopting a transdisciplinary design uh, approach? And, and I guess, Tiff, particularly from a, a student perspective, what does that mean for their future careers? 
Um, what we found is, you know, just moving sort of back a little bit with the, the whole idea of, you know, of, of getting people on board. I think, you know, when you have like a, a group of students in a room, some of whom have, have never collaborated with anyone before in their lives, and they, they just look at you thinking, what on earth are you going to get me what, to isn't do? It just done individual <laughs> practice. Yeah, just actual really? practice. So, and usually what, we, what we're doing is, you know, when we say, well, you're going to be in teams and you're going to be, you know, obviously addressing challenges... And they think, how on earth are we going to be doing this? So, you know, it's about, un you know, getting the understanding of, of how good it is to do something like that for starters. So what we do is we do bring back students who have really been in that position a year or two ago and to use them as exemplars in a sense to say, you know, come in, tell the students what you did for your collaborative challenge project, how you worked in teams. You know, sometimes we'll bring a whole team in as well. And where you went from there as well, what happened, what, what did you learn from that and where did you take, what did you take forward? And I think, you know, first of all, it's really good to offer those insights for students as a, as a first step because a lot of them can't really foresee how good something is until you've done it. I know it sounds bizarre, but I think, you know, when you're, you're first met with, like, this unit that's going to go on for three months, you know, when students have no idea how it might even look at the end of it, it it's, it's quite daunting, I think. So we do try and address that with like a, almost like a show and tell of, of things that have, you know, happened. We look at the challenges, the benefits as well. And I think the whole unit was based around the premise of soft skill sets and how to unlock those and how to do that when you actually work in a collaborative and transdisciplinary way. So the idea of soft skill sets is to look at your skills and attributes. And obviously, if you're working in a team of marketeers, people who have media backgrounds and people who are makers and come together and, and do quite great things together, it's about how you influence each other and what skills you're learning from each other as well as what you're bringing to the table. And I think that's a really powerful thing, you know, to really unlock those soft skills because they're the skills that you need to be really successful in the creative industries, no matter what industry it might be. And I think, you know, interestingly, when we get to the end of the unit, um, and this is also looking at the industry we work with, with the particular partners, we do have industry turn around and say, do you know what, I'd really like to take on some paid internships. And we're like, oh, great, okay, so who would this be? And, and they always say to us, well, we, we don't know what that role is. It's like, well, that, that, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? Because it's new, you know, where every year we have a sea change of collaborative challenge where when we bring industry in, we seem to find there's new themes, there's new challenges, there's other things to consider. And those are those new jobs that, that are being created right there and then, interestingly. So what we tend to get is students will, you know, come back to myself and my colleague and say, well, actually... I've been offered this internship, but I don't know quite what it is. I can't really define it. And it's like, well, that's great. You know, what, what would you like to call yourself? You know, what would you, you know, why don't you pitch what you'd like to do in that particular industry to that person who we, you know, we've connected you with? And actually, that happens a lot. And it's really interesting that we get our students almost pitching back to clients, to our industry, you know, sort of connections, what they are going to do, what that job might look like. Um, and also, I've lost my thread now. <laughs> I, but I love, I think there's two things that are really yeah. interesting, that bottom-up approach, because yeah. actually I think our student body almost know more than us about yeah, things like sustainability, about technology. The other thing I think that's really fascinating that you said about this, the soft skills, I think we're, it's something we're not necessarily taught. Just a little recommendation, I'm reading an amazing book at the moment called Connect, How to Build Exceptional Relationships. Um, just because I was interested in how our team members can give us feedback very openly. And uh, it's a really amazing, um, uh, it's called, the I think, the touchy-feely uh, module as part of Harvard Business School. Just a, a bit of a recommendation there. Um, I'm going to just throw that to Moritz and then we're going to open up to questions. So anything to talk about your biggest challenges in the transdisciplinary approach? Uh, yeah, I think one of the most recent challenges is to actually get people, and especially young people, to come in to work in the studio. I think the whole COVID situation really hasn't helped there. Uh, and also the fact that uh, London is quite such a harsh place to survive nowadays. So as in the past, we've had interns, like people just offering to help on projects, uh, and that has sort of slowly died away. Uh, for us, it's also uh, quite 
important to find uh, technology uh, students to come and collaborate, and uh, that uh, is also increasingly difficult to find like uh, young talent to uh, to contribute and to uh, also do like quite technical work. Um, I was just going to add, uh, I think one thing that we um, find, and I think you know, is is on a very kind of individual level. You know, I think I think in order to truly collaborate, you have to relinquish control. You know, you have to, you know except you're not in control. Um, and that's a, you know incredibly scary thing for individuals, organizations, anyone, communities, you know, to, to not be in control. And so it, for me, it's, it, you, know, you really need to, you know, in terms of understanding how to do that, being able to do that is, is actually an incredible show of strength. That's what you know, I believe in. I think peculiarly, we've looked at it the other way around. We look at the kind of, you know, the, the, the artist as singular kind of genius as being the kind of strength. I'm not saying that that's the easy route, but I'm just saying that there is, you know, in some ways, it's like, you know, it is easier to just tell people this is how Don't we're Don't you think do in it. design, though, we've sort of been trained with this idea of ego? And yeah, yeah. You have to sort of leave that at the door a bit, right? Well, I think it's, and we've protected it as well. I mean, I think, um, obviously, there are fantastic pieces that have been made in, in, uh, in, in, in all forms of culture by individuals. But, um, you know, often the pieces that have been produced kind of by the collective have been, you know, seen as lesser in some way. Um, and, I, and I, you know, and I think also it comes hand in hand with the, even the idea of the kind of, yeah, the, the unique genius who is badly behaved, dysfunctional, you know, and again, I think there's things there that we, you know, fortunately now are kind of catching up with and, and starting to root out. So... Um, yeah, that's that, that's what we try and teach of our well, of our team is sort of like, look, just get comfortable with not being in control. <laughs> there's a there's a big limitation with this like artist uh, approaches with that you're limited to just yourself, and uh, if you want to create like more complex uh, projects, uh, then at one point in time it, it just doesn't work anymore. You need to bring in people, right? Uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, exactly what you're saying, then you have to uh, give them some control over. Yeah. Talking uh, of bringing in people and moving into the uncomfortable zone, I'd love to throw open to the audience um, any questions. If you don't mind saying your name and if you feel you have a discipline or uh, what you, how you describe your practice. Um, sure. So I'm Sneha and um, I'm, uh, I run a curatorial studio. Um, and I was kind of interested in understanding... I think we've discussed kind of what a transdisciplinary team um, kind of looks like. But I was wondering, how does one actually build a successful uh, team? You know, like one that actually works well together. Because as we know, when you put a lot of people in, in a room together with different backgrounds, it can be quite hard for them to, you know, align. <laughs> Great question. Who wants to attack that first? How do you actually? It's something that you brought up actually, Natsa, as well. Um, you know, cultural institutes are always quite interesting, and I don't know why this is, but when we... I was working at the Crafts Council before my current job now, and what we were thinking of is looking at how makers, craft makers, could actually progress or push their practice in other industries. Um, I'd already worked in the NHS um, in, in an arts role, so I thought, actually, it might be quite interesting to look at health. So we were thinking, well, actually... If we look at makers and what they do, how could they work with health academics to push practice? But how could they do that so that you don't have someone leading that? Is there a parity that you can kind of create so that everybody has a good role in this? So um, at King's Cultural Institute, I met um, the kind of link people for both education and innovation, which was quite interesting. And what they did was um, they have a team who they they kind of draw up from. So they have what we call um, knowledge exchange leaders in each of the um, schools, the health schools. So there might be someone in, say, you know, nursing and midwifery, someone in robotics and, um, you know, and surgeries, someone in soft robotics. So what they did was they put that kind of question out there. You know, would you like to work with a craft maker to look at something very interesting, maybe a research project or work with PhD students, whatever it might be, to look at how we can push that practice and innovation a little bit on parity, but it's a seeding project. You know, we can come in with somebody, see how we can do that. So what we did was we created a template for academics and makers to work together. And this was one of those, even, one of those nights where I didn't have a, a wink sleep because <laughs> it's my husband's fault. What had happened is I thought, well, how do I get makers and academics to 
meet each other and say hello in a meeting space, you know. So we thought, right, we've got some academics who are interested. We've got some makers who are interested. We have a, had about 12 on each side. And I said, yeah, I know what, we'll do matchmaking. And my husband just said to me, how on earth are you going to do matchmaking between academics? Academics won't want to do matchmaking. I said, well, we can try it, you know. So we, we, we did that and also obviously, you know, had a nice little meeting space afterwards over some lunch. And interestingly, what happened is um, we had six really strong um, sort of proposals for really working together. And um, we chose all six because, in a sense, they really worked very hard to find those, that parity between the academic and the maker. And I think one particular, well, there were quite a few really successful ones out of this. It was three months long, um, and what happened in the residency itself um, is the, the maker would go into King's and work with the academics in order to, you know, sort of push forward something that was becoming a bit of a sticking point, a challenge. So there was one particular maker who was an embroiderer called Karina who worked with a soft roboticist. And the issue and problem there was that they weren't getting any real data from um, the movement of people who were recovering from quite serious surgeries because it was lab, it was very in a very controlled lab-based environment where you're just getting people moving in a quite sort of, you know, not natural manner. So they worked with, um, the soft roboticists worked with Karina to um, produce like an embroidered piece that, that you know, um, patients could wear during the day that was lovely and soft that they could move around in and it actually captured the real data of somebody recovering over the weeks. And that, that data is what's needed to understand, you know, how people are actually recovering in their lives, uh, going about their everyday, you know, sort of jobs or existence. And it's, it was, you know, ideas like this that were becoming quite successful, but you do have to create an environment to make that work, you know, and you do have to have that understanding and that, that real clarity. And I'm, I've taken this forward with my teaching as well, that there has to be some form of clarity there, you know, to, to understand there's a framework, there's a start and an end point, there's stuff that happens in there where, you know, you have those touch points and you have that understanding of working together quite clearly, but there's, a, there's space to allow for that creativity to happen as well. So that's a very long answer. Well, I was going to, yeah, I was going to add into that because I think... Um, it, it always felt to me that like friction actually is also a really important part of, of collaboration. You know, and it's although we're talking about kind of how you can come together to find ways of having you know shared goals and values that you might then kind of bring you know bring to fruition through different disciplines. But actually, that you need friction. You know, you you do need difference. You need uh, people to disagree, and but you know, there's ways of disagreeing in a in a in a productive way. So again, it's sort of for us, we're always looking out for you know people who are passionate about what they do and, you know, and want to put them with others who are passionate about what they do and understand that they believe what they believe and they are passionate about it, but someone else believes what they believe and they're passionate about it. And that's, that's fascinating, you know, how, how we can have different perspectives on this particular thing, you know, how do we... And finding that common ground, really, or finding kind of that way forward is, is uh, yeah, it's fascinating. And that keeps me going every day, I think, that uncertainty. I think we've got time for literally one more quick question. I, I saw one more hand. Was there? Yeah, I think there was a hand there. Yeah. Hi, I um, facilitate design processes in a lot of bureaucratic settings, so like government agencies and also universities. Um, and so something I frequently run into when we're trying to get this transdisciplinary group of folks in a room together working in this way is this like, reaction that like this isn't efficient you know because there's so much time that you need to spend building relationships and that friction and sort of even just getting to speak the same language um but i think it's worth it and that's you know there's a lot of value in spending that time so i was wondering if that's sort of that inefficiency argument is something any of you all run into and how you navigate that with like the value of spending that time Maybe we were talking about this um, yesterday because uh, in, in our world it's very difficult to, um, everyone knows everyone, it's pretty niche, um, so there's trust uh, that you can take for granted to some degree. 
Um, but once that trust becomes mediated by a contract uh, with financials, um, then it becomes a little bit more precarious. Um, and so what we try to do as much as possible is spend a long time getting to know people who we already know now from a business context. Um, it's not always successful. Uh, primarily, I think there, there is just this ongoing like misunderstanding of what design is um, and what design is to, 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 to science. Um, but where you can build that trust, then you can have amazing moments where you know, normal phenomena of life was born out of uh, an ongoing relationship, you know, over a span of six years. Um, and, and it happened right at the end of a weekly call. It's like, oh, that's an interesting thing that you're working on. Let's do it. And you can only then do that really unimaginable thing once you've put in sometimes X amount of years worth of relationship building. Um, it's tough, but then you can expedite um, more impactful outcomes. And, and I think you're right, it's, it's totally worth it. And then it's a long game. You win some, you lose some. I also wonder, just, I used to facilitate between um, material scientists and designers and the, the, the Institute of Mining, they're you know, very suited and booted, quite serious men. And I found putting everyone out of their comfort zone really helps. So I used to make them you know, stand in custard with their socks off and stuff like that. To, I mean, genuinely to, to talk about the sensorial relationship with materials. And there's nothing like when you're all standing in custard with your socks off. It's a kind of levelling experience. So I do wonder if humour or... Um, United in trauma, you know, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> United in trauma, yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, we're going to have to wrap up now, but just thank you so much to, to Moritz, to uh, Jason, to Natsai, to Tiff for your time today. And thank you um, for spending time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Mm -hmm.